Welcome to the Secret Rugby Lines, made just for you by Bright Rock, where every week a rather well-known South African reveals they've got a secret rugby background. And this week, it's the man who can do just about anything, Mavs Maponyani. This week, our secret rugby life is a man who's just annoyingly good at stuff because, Maps Mapanyana, I remember the first time we played golf together was in a golf day. You shot 63, you won both long drives and you won the day. <laughs> uh, we played cricket together on a charity day. First delivery, you ambled up for, for a long run and almost knocked Albie Morkel's head off with a bouncer. <laughs> I've seen you play football. You're even better than your dad was. Uh, I'm guessing that rugby is probably another one of these things that just comes effortlessly to you. <laughs> I think I just, uh, you know, I've always loved rugby, but I think the element of that probably comes from the soccer side because I was kind of, I was in awe of players like Andrew Mertens and Carlos Spencer and um, and uh, Dan Carter and how, how they were with the boot. And I figured, you know, this is something that required so much beautiful um, skill with, um, you know, uh, of course, with with, with passing, but flair, and they came with so much beautiful flair, especially King Carlos, and um, you know that was just that was just something that actually initially really got me excited about about rugby and playing rugby at school. I remember in pre-primary, it wasn't really allowed at home. My mother was just saying that it's absolutely silly that I'd be wanting to play rugby. She was obviously scared for her boy to, to, to get knocked a few times. And the bug really bit when I would sit and watch rugby with my brother. He's six years older than me. And he was a fantastic rugby player. Played all team, um, A team throughout his, um, his school life and, and first team. And he was an incredible fly half. And I think that's where even more I got excited about it. And when high school came around and I had the option to, to take up rugby, it was a natural kind of thing for me to try slot into fly half or full back or whatever required the boot and a couple of big hits. So there probably would have been an expectation of a number 10 jersey, but a football number 10 jersey <laughs> and, and building on the Mapunyane jeans, for which your dad is so famous. Uh, was it a number 10 jersey in rugby that you settled on? It was the number 10 jersey, oscillated between that number 10 and number 15. Kind of uh, an, an early, an early Damien Willem so. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, but uh, absolutely nothing like him. <laughs> um, and I think, I think in the end, I, I, I kind of slotted in that front stay in position for a few of those long kicks and, um, you know, and, and kicking the ball out in touch wherever I could. And honestly, in the end, I think I just always was a really good pass over the ball because the quicker I could, rid I could get rid of it, the better. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I obviously love the sidestepping and the passes through the back and everything. Yeah, Carlos Spencer, for a young kid to watch was obviously exciting, but probably really bad for the fundamentals of <laughs> getting into the basics of rugby, because they immediately went out the gates trying to do that, and a lot of the time got pounded for, for, for good reason. <laughs> uh, they do talk about backline boys being the pretty boys of rugby. <laughs> You're not really helping the counter to this argument. Dan, it gets worse. I remember the first time I, I did uh, my, my trials for rugby in, in high school, I didn't have contact lenses yet. So fly half, I mean, I think that's where that, that wanting to immediately catch and get rid of it, fly half seemed like the right position because, you know, I, I, I could avoid a lot of contact and I could be wearing my spectacles the first few times before my contacts came. <laughs> and, and only once that happened, I kind of just went, went in really hard with everything else and actually found myself end up getting concussed a couple of times. <laughs> You've seen lots of live games, different parts of the world. Of all of them, as a passing shot, which is the one that gave you the fondest memories? Have that jolt of rugby fan electricity going through you? Ooh. I remember being in New Zealand and in Wellington with everyone buzzing and the whole town all wearing their black and all feeling like it was going to be an easy defeat against the Springboks and getting to go to a couple of the conferences, the press conferences, and seeing South Africa really wanting to make sure that they don't just be seen as a pushover in that game and how they fought through that grit and being a group of you know, 50 South Africans in the crowd losing our minds and an absolute elation was, was an incredible experience. Talking about the rugby experiences that you've had, 
Did I not see you sneaking on to the Springbok <laughs> bus in that great 2019 countrywide celebration? I don't know about sneaking on, but you know, I was I was doing some work for uh, for one of the sponsors at the time, and you know, over the months leading up to the World Cup, got to engage with the players a lot and got quite a great rapport, and happened to um, you know had good relationships with a few of them and was then asked to kind of be a part of that tour and 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 and, and cover it for this for the sponsor and the players invited me onto the bus and welcomed me with open arms and it was the most amazing experience i can probably i can probably remember as far as um sporting memories go because i got to go along on this wonderful celebration for this incredible achievement that everyone in south africa felt that they were a part of because we were a part of, you know, backing the boys, being stronger together and going through every little town, crooks and crannies all across um, South Africa. And it was, it was spectacular. Just being on that bus, going through towns where people were just crying, shouting, screaming. I think work stopped for everyone. It was kind of a, um, you know, an unspoken public holiday period for a good week with everyone celebrating. And I'll, I'll never forget people kind of banging on the buses, shouting, throwing up caps and balls to be signed. Um, Sia and, and um, uh, you know, uh, Lucano and a, a, f a few of the players like Mapimpi actually getting hit by underwear here and there by, <laughs> by the ladies who all adored him. Something, of course, you are far more used to. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was great. I think I spent half the time actually being the photographer for them, <laughs> um, which was, was just really, really fun. But, you know, in, in, in all seriousness, it's something I'll, I'll always cherish and, and always love and just seeing the spirit of literally millions and millions of people lining the streets to celebrate these 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 guys who, who all put their heart into representing the country and seeing it all literally unified before us. Oh, I've got goosebumps just hearing you remember it. <laughs> it's really awesome. Uh, well, I, I, I'm sorry we never saw you in a professional number 10 jersey, but I think it's been <laughs> the, the gain of magazine covers and television shows around the world. Uh, and I know we'll both be glued to our televisions and possibly even doing a bit of travel uh, this year as our shared love of rugby comes to the fore. Absolutely. <laughs> So there we go. Yes, you know him as uh, uh, the star of a sort of television shows and the cover of just about every magazine ever been published. But behind all of that, there's a man who loves his rugby and in a number 10 jersey for a while showed a fair bit of promise as well. The Secret Rugby Life of Maps Mopanyane, made just for you by Brightrock.